Can I help you? I'm looking for a Mandalorian. Well, we don't get many visitors in these parts. Can you describe him? Someone who looks like me. You mean the Marshal? Your Marshal wears Mandalorian armor? Huh? See for yourself. Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This is gonna be my new Mandalorian season two, episode one video. Congratulations, you made it. We finally have new episodes. I'll be doing videos for all the episodes this season, so be sure to subscribe to get all those. We'll do a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave your favorite WTF moment from the episode on the video or favorite Easter egg. Careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet and everything from season one, there were a ton of Easter eggs that we have to cover. So we'll do top 10 WTF and just Easter eggs throughout the episode as we go along. Starting with number 10, the title of the episode, The Marshal, as a reference to Cobb Vance's character played by Timothy Oliphant, who's kind of doing a version of his Seth Bullock character from Deadwood. He also even used a similar accent that he used on the Deadwood series. If you haven't seen that series, it's amazing, but it's a Western, like The Mandalorian is a space Western, so a lot of the references do carry over pretty nicely. But the opening scene starts with the Mando and Baby Yoda walking up into town in the middle of the night. There's graffiti everywhere reminding everyone of Sabine Wren's graffiti from Star Wars Rebels, everyone wondering if she's going to show up during the series because Ahsoka is supposed to show up. As Baby Yoda looks around, you see all these red eyes start to light up. You notice the graffiti has a lot of Easter eggs in it too. The artist who did this is named David Cho. He's actually famous in real life for doing this type of graffiti art. He has a big cameo as one of the spectator aliens during the big fighting ring scene a little bit after this. You notice a bunch of white images of helmets. Those are obviously meant to signify stormtroopers. You notice yellow for C-3PO Easter eggs. There's a blue aqualish face that stands out pretty prominently. And then above the door here, before he goes in, you see a Toydarian face, like Watto's face, and a Gamorrean face, because obviously they're fighting in the ring. Number nine, the Gamorrean fighting ring. So as he goes in, he's looking for someone called Gore Koresh. The Twi'lek bouncer greets him outside. This is actually a character actor that's shown up in a lot of the Marvel movies, so you may recognize him from somewhere. As he walks down to the ring, though, you notice all the banners above the fighting ring. Those are just for the territories in and around the Outer Rim planets, because he makes a lot of references to Mandalorians hiding out in different clans, like his clan was hiding out on Navarro. I'm still trying to identify every single alien here in the fighting ring. Some of them are a little more obvious than others. So if you know who some of the more obscure aliens are, be sure to write them below in the comments. But a lot of these aliens you'll notice are aliens that appeared during Jabba's palace at some part during Return of the Jedi. Because even though they're referencing a lot of different Star Wars series and movies during each of the episodes, this episode in particular, for a number of reasons, heavily referenced Return of the Jedi because of a couple characters that showed up during the episode and them going back to Tatooine. David Cho, the graffiti artist in this cameo here, seems like he's meant to be a Nikto. Here's a Twi'lek, also from Jabba's Palace. Baby Yoda just seems absolutely fascinated by the fighting as they're walking around, panning around all these different creatures. The Gore Koresh character that he was speaking to during all the trailer footage with the one eye is an Abyssin, their native Tabis in the Deep Core, that was a planet featured during the Dark Empire comics where Emperor Palpatine stored all his clones. They kind of tried to reference that with all the clones that showed up on Exegol during Rise of Skywalker. But a lot of people heard his voice during the trailer wondering who he was. It's a celebrity cameo for sure, but I wouldn't have known who it was unless I looked in the credits. It's John Leguizamo. He changed his voice quite a bit and they processed it to make it sound even more different. So if you didn't guess that it was him, don't feel bad. But during their conversation, he's trying to find other Mandalorians so that they can help him find any of the Jedi that survived Order 66 in The Purge. They remind you about what happened to the Mandalorians and they remind you of that scene in Season 1, Episode 8 where they find the pile of Beskar armor and all of his dead comrades. He references killing other Mandalorians and taking their Beskar because its price is rising, it's becoming more valuable in the galaxy as it becomes more scarce. They do the big whistling bird scene from the trailer, Baby Yoda closing his shell, which is kind of funny. He throws his vibroblade into the Zabrak here, which is the race that Darth Maul comes from. He takes out the Twi'lek and then after he strings up Gore Koresh, he tells him that the only Mandalorian that he knows about is back on Tatooine. So everyone's like, wait a minute, are they talking about Boba Fett? Obviously this is all set up for Cobb Vanth and that big twist. 
He also makes a reference to the Gatra. He swears by the Gatra. That's actually a reference to a group called the Droid Gatra, which is an organization that they introduced during the Grand Moff Tarkin book from 2014 in the Aftermath novel series, also where Cobb Vanth appeared for the first time. That group is made up of a bunch of repurposed battle droids left over from the Clone Wars who are advocating for droid emancipation. They're based mostly on Coruscant, so I don't know if they're going to bring that group up later this season or if that was just meant to be a one-off reference. But he tells him he needs to go to Mos Pelagos, a city on Tatooine. So number eight, return to Tatooine with a bunch of Return of the Jedi Easter eggs. Like I said, a lot of Return of the Jedi references during the episode because they're returning to Tatooine. Return of the Jedi, you can make all the Baby Yoda Jedi Mandalorian jokes you want. The Yodalorian. He is kind of the future of the Jedi Order, and because he's part of the Mandalorian's clan, tangentially, you could also consider Baby Yoda a Mandalorian right now. There's always been a lot of people ever since season one that have theorized that the title of the series, The Mandalorian, is actually a reference to Baby Yoda, not to Din Djarin. But he goes back to the exact same Mos Eisley spaceport. Remember, the docking port that he lands in is the same one that the Millennium Falcon was docked in during A New Hope. Amy Sedaris' character comes back from season one, and they bring back the repair droids from Phantom Menace. She calls Baby Yoda a womp rat. There are a lot of womp rat references during the episode, too. She makes a joke about him liking droids now, but that's just a reference to what happened with IG-11 in the season one finale, saving them by sacrificing himself. So the Mando kind of respects some droids now. He makes another reference to the network of coverts around the Outer Rim territories, the smaller pockets of Mandalorian clans that are hiding out like his was. That might wind up leading us to Ahsoka, to Katie Sackhoff's Bo-Katan Kryze character. They're just letting you know that there are a lot of other Mandalorians hiding around the galaxy that we'll run into throughout this season and future seasons. They bring back R5 from A New Hope. I believe it's supposed to be the same R5 unit. She brings up the map of Tatooine from before the war. They reference Mos Eisley, Mos Espa again. Then Mos Pelgo is just meant to be an old mining settlement that collapsed after the fall of the Empire. You get the big full backstory once you meet Cobb Vance's character though. He takes the same speeder bike from season one, episode five, but this time Baby Yoda is riding in his back on the pouch. He stops to talk to more Tusken Raiders who are roasting what seems like a Kowakian monkey lizard. That's the salacious crumb creature. We saw some of those roasting on spits during season one. As he continues through the desert, he passes a giant Bantha skeleton, which is a nice callback to the crate dragon skeleton from A New Hope. And obviously a lot of those references to the crate dragon go back to A New Hope. The small rodent creatures that scurry away as he rides into town are literally called scurriers. They're featured during Attack of the Clones when Anakin Skywalker comes back to save his mother. You see a bunch of moisture farming towers, just a lot of familiar structures and architecture from other parts of Tatooine in the Star Wars movies. Then number seven, the Mandalorian meets Cobb Vanth. So there's a weak way bartender, another Return of the Jedi reference. He's a celebrity cameo. It's W. Earl Brown, who was also on the Deadwood series with Timothy Olfont. The weak way is just another alien that was working on Jabba's sail barge during Luke Skywalker's rescue of Han Solo and Leia above the Sarlacc pit. Very relevant to this episode when they go to take down the crate dragon referencing the Sarlacc and because of the big Boba Fett twist at the end of the episode. Just as Baby Yoda peeks his head around the corner and they make the reference to the Marshal showing up, they give you the full reveal. He walks in in Boba Fett's armor. And obviously it doesn't seem like Boba Fett. So even if you didn't know who the Cobb Vanth character was right away, you kind of knew that this probably wasn't Boba Fett. He gives himself away though when he orders two shots of Spotchka. That's the same drink that's made from the krill that they were farming during season one, episode four. So the show is already starting to reference itself. I love the Mando's reaction though when he takes his helmet off so that he can drink. Mando's so surprised that he just stopped dead in his tracks like what the hell just happened? Why did you take your helmet off? Immediately it gives him away as being a non-Mandalorian. What are you doing with that armor? Take it off right now or I will take it off of you. They have a very Han versus Greedo who shot first gunslinger standoff moment foreshadowing eventual gunslinger standoff between the Mando and Boba Fett. Like they're building towards a good, the bad, and the ugly, talking about Western references. The three-way standoff with Mando, Moff Gideon, and Boba Fett. I guess Mando would be the good, Moff Gideon would be the bad, and Boba Fett would be the ugly in that situation. But they're stopped short by the ground tremor caused by the crate dragon. So number six, the great crate dragon hunt in the Return of the Jedi flashback scene. The way they play the crate dragon reveal is a little bit like the Dune series with the sandworms. It travels underneath the earth instead of on top of it. 
but Cobb Vanth agrees to give him Boba Fett's armor if he helps kill the Krayt Dragon because the Krayt Dragon has been terrorizing this area for a long, long time. I love the way he referenced the second Death Star too when he's talking about his backstory. So they flash back to the end of Return of the Jedi and they're watching the explosion of the second Death Star on the holonet. Then he says the mining consortium just moved in in the vacuum left by the Empire and took over town. As he runs out to escape, you may recognize the speeder from A New Hope. He also talks about the Camtono. They bring that back from season one, which is basically the ice cream maker from Empire Strikes Back. He finds the crystals, which he then trades to the Jawas for Boba Fett's armor, but not before they try to pawn off a couple other Star Wars Easter eggs on him. So there's the R2 unit that just colored a little bit differently. Then you probably recognize this droid's head from A New Hope when C-3PO wakes up inside the Sandcrawler. It's based on the original designs for C-3PO and Ralph McQuarrie's concept art. But that's when Cobb Vanth then came back to town becoming the quote unquote marshal, just getting rid of the mining consortium and helping the people. You also probably spotted that the speeder bike that he was using is actually salvaged parts from a pod racer from Phantom Menace. But not just any pod racer, this is actually taken from Anakin Skywalker's pod racer. Now that's pod racing. But my other favorite easter egg here about Boba Fett's armor is actually a big callback to the Star Wars Holiday Special. The first appearance of the Boba Fett character was during the Star Wars Holiday Special, and it was because they were going to create a toy to sell. It actually had a rocket launcher that you could fire just pressing a little button, but because their lawyers were concerned that children would choke on the rocket that you could fire out of the Boba Fett toy, they had to recall it, so almost nobody got their hands on that particular toy. It's actually a pretty big collector's item if you have one. And if you guys didn't know, other big Star Wars Holiday Special goings on, they did a brand new one that they're going to drop before Thanksgiving. That's right, Jon Favreau joked about doing a new Star Wars Holiday Special last year. They actually did it, and we're going to see it in a couple weeks. Number five, the redemption of the Tusken Raiders after Attack of the Clones. He uses a Tusken Raider call to call them out and get the creatures to submit. They reveal they also want to get rid of the crate Dragon, so they want to team up. They go back to their encampment, and you actually learn that they're way more chill than they appeared during Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Most of what we know about the Tusken Raiders are from A New Hope, when they just go ham on Luke Skywalker, and he has to be saved by Obi-Wan Kenobi, then Attack of the Clones, when they capture and kill Anakin Skywalker's mother, and he winds up killing the entire village, all the women, all the children, post all your Anakin Skywalker memes. They were pretty obvious about wanting to redeem them as characters during the episode, the Mando trying to bridge that gap, like, no, 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 you have to work together or this isn't going to happen. He really, really loves using that flamethrower. I think he almost used it in every single episode of season one. We'll see if that trend continues in season two. Number four, the Mandalorian versus the Krayt Dragon, round one. So the lair of the Krayt Dragon might give you flashbacks to the Mudhorn battle from episode two. But the crate Dragon is living in an abandoned Sarlacc pit. They make a joke about the crate Dragon eating a Sarlacc. And then you kind of get a picture for how big it actually is. Baby Yoda starts freaking out when he senses the crate Dragon coming. There wasn't a whole lot of Baby Yoda going on during the episode. They really just cut to him every once in a while for a reaction shot. But when they're explaining all this, they also kind of imply what happened with Boba Fett. So because they're close to the original Sarlacc pit from Return of the Jedi, they're also kind of implying that's part of how Boba Fett escaped the Sarlacc. The crate Dragon may have attacked or eaten the Sarlacc that he was in, and he may have just used that chaos to escape. I love the fact that it doesn't take the bait. The crate Dragon itself actually seems really intelligent the way it tries to fight them, especially later in the episode. Then Mando sets up the alliance with the townspeople so they have to partner up with the Tusken Raiders that they've been fighting and killing this entire time. That's another theme of the Mandalorian season two, really the whole show, former adversaries working together to defeat a common enemy that's even worse, like say Moff Gideon, for instance, like all the different clans of Mandalorians hiding out in the galaxy, banding back together to take down Moff Gideon. They make a reference to the Dune Sea. Really, anytime you're on Tatooine, everything that they reference has something to do with either A New Hope or Return of the Jedi. The number three, The Mandalorian versus the Krayt Dragon, round two. So this time, they're able to get it out of its cave just a little bit. It takes a while to get it into place, but it starts spewing its bile all over them, and it turns out it's really acidic. They really upgraded a lot of their action sequences. They have that really cool scene with Mando and Cobb Vanth using their jetpacks to get up close and then maneuver around. Cobb Vanth, pretty good with that jetpack for not being a Mandalorian. 
he uses Boba Fett's rocket launcher again to position the crate dragon so that Mando can let himself get eaten with the Bantha and all the charges to take it down from the inside. So number two, now the Mando has acquired Boba Fett's armor and it's just going to be on the Razor Crest. Obviously, that's going to come back in later episodes. Very important detail. He also says, hopefully we'll meet again. And that's just a reference to him coming back and cameoing in a future episode, potentially. But as you notice the Tusken Raiders picking through the carcass of the Crate Dragon, they find the Crate Dragon's pearl, which is basically priceless. And of course, number one, WTF moment, the big Boba Fett ending scene reveal. So as Mando is riding across the sunset in the landscape at the end of the episode, they reveal he's being watched from a vantage point by Boba Fett, who's not wearing his armor, clearly recognizable as Tamura Morrison. He seems like he notices the Mandalorian wearing his armor and sees that he has his armor, like he's probably been tracking Cobb Vanth, trying to take his armor back. I don't know how many episodes he's supposed to be in, obviously at least one more big episode, but probably a little bit more than that. I think the pitch is that he might become a bigger character in season three. John Favreau wrote most of the episodes, but Dave Filoni, get this, wrote and directed episode five. So that's best odds at when Ahsoka Tano is going to appear for the first time. She's being played by Rosario Dawson, but they've been really quiet and been holding way back on revealing what's going on with her during season two. But my Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 2 video will post next Friday. It'll be the same schedule for all the episodes this season. And I will do more bonus videos for Boba Fett, Ahsoka, and the bigger Easter eggs and teasers week to week. So just leave all your Mandalorian video requests in the comments for things you want me to make videos about. I'll name a giveaway winner when I post my next Star Wars video. Click here for my full Star Wars Mandalorian Season 2 trailer video. And click here for all my Mandalorian episode videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe. This is the way.